founder. I'm Caroline Pennington, your host. Today I have Jessica Winder joining us. Jessica is the founder of Hidden Gem Career Coaching. She's a keynote speaker and author. She's the senior vice president and chief people officer at Refine Labs and a professional troublemaker. Woo woo. <laughs> Every time somebody calls me a professional troublemaker, I'm like, yes, that's what I want to be known as. <laughs> I was like, we're going to get to that, but I want to talk about that too. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be fun. So I'd love to hear your story of how did you get into the people business? Yeah, so actually my background is I wanted to go to medical school. So way back in the day, I was like pre-med. I have a master's in public health from the University of Sydney. When I came back to, I lived in Sydney for two years, came back, had what I consider to be now an epiphany. At the time, it was a crisis. Um, you know, it, in the middle of it, it was a crisis. And I was like, I don't want to go to school anymore. I had gone from like undergrad to graduate school and I didn't take a break and I was just not having it. And the thought, I had gotten accepted to medical school and to tell my parents that we worked this hard and I got in, but I don't want to go was... Uh, it was a lot. And so I had to tell them, I don't want to go. And I had a friend who worked in HR and I just said, hey, I'm going to defer for six months and then I'm going to go to medical school. I just need a job for six months. And so she actually found me a job at her same company in oil and gas as at like a six month contract recruiter. Um, and just by the luck and grace, I had a manager there who believed in me and who I actually confided in and told, I actually told her, I don't want to go to medical school. And she was the first person that I actually told that to. And so she was like, well, if you don't want to go, I can teach you all the things that I know. And she really took me under her wing and everything that she did, she would like let me follow along when she would do conversations and onboarding and offboarding and terminations. And, and I would just follow her along like a little penguin, <laughs> like everywhere she went, you would see me. Um, but I stayed there for three years. So I ended, it was a six month contract. I ended up being there for three years. And that really laid the foundation because I did everything from payroll and benefits to like onboarding. She really just let me kind of go for it. Like anything that you can think of in HR as a generalist, that was the foundation. Um, and then three years later, she basically was like a little baby bird. She was like, well, you gotta go. We don't have you know, we don't have a role for you. And it was a small company. So she pushed me out of the nest and was like, you're ready to be a manager, but uh, you're not gonna do it here because uh, we don't have any spots for that. So yeah, that was 13 years ago and I've been doing people ops ever since. <laughs> That's an amazing story. I mean, to go from having a med background and then to all the effort to get into med school yes. and then having to have the courage to tell your parents, okay, I've gotten into med school. I'm clearly very smart, but <laughs> I'm passionate about doing, I mean, that must have been a huge change. And then to go into yeah. the people business is like, it sounds like you really had to bootstrap your way up from learning from nothing to from nothing. Yes. I didn't even know what HR was. Like literally when I got the job, I Googled what is HR? <laughs> like I had no concepts of like what happens in business because my mind frame was one track, medical school, medicine, science, biology. And so it was completely left field. Like I would literally go home at night and Google business terms. I had no foundation. Like I didn't take a think a single business class in college. Um, so it really, that is why I'm such a big advocate for mentors because I, without her, I would not have been where I am today because she knew that I didn't know anything and she still decided or, you know, saw something in me that I could figure it out. That's amazing. And then your book, The Hidden Gem, talks a lot about the hidden gems. I don't want to talk too more about the hidden gems within existing employees that companies currently have. And mm -hmm. how, do, how do companies identify those hidden gems within their existing employees? And then once they identify the hidden gems, how do they really harness those skills and talent to make that employee thrive and be productive? Mm -hmm. So the whole reason, the whole concept behind Hidden Gem is I am, I don't consider myself to be a hidden gem because I'm very vocal. I once put together an entire slideshow presentation on why I should get a promotion. So I was very, I'm very in your face and this is why you should choose me. Like that's just the type of person that I am. But with friends and family and coworkers, I would sit and I would watch and I would see how people would be passed over that were very qualified that could do the job but they were too afraid to say anything or to speak up and me being me i'd be like well you need to do this and they're like well that's just not my personality and i uh it took me some time to understand that but 
that's where I got the concept hidden gem that there are all these people, whether it's someone who's a person of color, whether it's someone who's like an introvert that don't feel like they can speak up or they can put their name forward that we're just passing over and saying like, oh, but you know, they're here, they're doing that job, but we, I don't think they can be a manager. I don't know how many times I've had conversations with people where I say, oh, well, why, why not this person? Why would you want to go externally? And they will say, oh, this person doesn't have an executive presence but they can do all the other things of the job. They normally have been doing the job, they just didn't get the title or the salary increase. And I feel like that is absurd. <laughs> and so I wrote this whole book and it's mainly like journal entries and like my personal things that I've been through because I think there are so many hidden gems and you have to speak up even if you do it in your own way. I'm not saying everybody has to do a PowerPoint like I did, but if you do want it, I do have a template. Um, <laughs> I did get the promotion, by the way, after that presentation. But I think there's something to be said about people's strengths and like looking inside the organization first before you go external. I don't have any issue. I started out as a recruiter going external if you cannot find it internally. But I truly believe in growing your own. I would say too in that example you just gave about maybe an executive who doesn't have executive presence mm -hmm. and they check all the rest of the boxes that would be an opportunity where leadership could get an executive coach to come in absolutely and help them and that just would take you know you know a couple of months of coaching yeah. and then hopefully at that point that person would at least develop those skills and maybe they're not natural mm -hmm. but they can develop them yes yeah, um, some of the stuff is teachable and but people don't that i think we've gotten into this um, way of thinking in corporate where you just want someone to come in and have it. You don't want to teach them anything. Um, and I, that saddens me because I had somebody that taught me everything, you know, so to not want to teach anyone basic things, um, it's a detriment. In my opinion, I think it's best to hire for attitude and you can always train. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't teach attitude and aptitude. You can teach some of those things in the skill department and you're right. Companies do want all the boxes to be checked and maybe we can check 75 80 and the other 20 percent you actually do the training and learn just like you learn in HR profession. Yeah. yeah that's the way to do it it really really is but a lot of companies like you said they want you know a purple squirrel <laughs> or unicorn or whatever we want to call it nowadays <laughs> they do they do and so what would you or what would be your advice to the introvert who is looking for their promotion or does want to speak out and raise their hand, but they don't know how to do it. Yeah, my biggest recommendation is to start with your direct manager. So your direct hiring manager is normally you're going to be your biggest advocate when it comes to promotion time or any type of succession planning. They're the person that's gonna bring your name up so you that's the person like if you don't feel comfortable speaking to you know the whole leadership team but you can speak to your direct manager because they can advocate for you so that is the person that without a doubt i know throughout my career i've had people that advocated for me in rooms that i was not in um, because i had told them this is what i wanted i said I want to move up. I said I want to go get the certification or I want to grow in this area. So they knew. And you don't have to make it over the top. You can literally just say like, hey, this is something that I want in the future. I want to be promoted to manager, just as an example. And these are the things that I'm working on. Can you give me anything else that I need to do? So then you're putting that nugget in someone's head that you that that's something you even want. Because a lot of times when I'm in meetings now, I will ask you know managers, oh, what is that person? What do they want to do? And they'll say, I don't know. They haven't told me. So the first step is just to even say it. <laughs> oh my gosh, what you just said is so huge because I think that companies and this comes with the culture umbrella too is really engaging not just what their goals and you know revenue expectations or whatever is it's really understanding their employees like what makes them tick what is what do they really want and really providing a safe space for them to vocalize that and even if hey i want your job one day that should still be a non-threatening conversation because yeah. you know maybe this person can't have your job in the next three to five years and you're doing something else you know mm -hmm. yeah 
And I feel that way about my team. I have someone on my team who's my um, people ops manager. And without a doubt, I want her to get to my role. Like I want her to keep moving up. And we have those conversations. So it's very clear. If you ask me at any point what she wants, I could tell you. But you have to take that initiative as well. So I have taken that initiative to ask her. But throughout time, she's also come forward and said, I want to take this class or I want to get my PHR. All these things to let me know that she's trying to get there. So if you're an introvert, just start with one person. So as long no one person, your manager needs to know what you want to do so that they can advocate on your behalf. I think that's so good. And so if somebody wants to be recognized internally, you suggest them talk to their manager. What if they want to be recognized externally to eat, maybe go to a competitor or go to mm-hmm. you know a company that does something similar externally? What would you suggest? Yeah. So I think externally, that's where you got to have a coach. And there's so many avenues you can go with coaching, whether that's like career coaching, which is something I I do on the side. And some of my clients, that's what we're working on is they want to grow, but they've hit like a limit where they are and they need to move out. So sometimes to move up, you got to move out. And so having a coach is one part of it. Two is just deciding what do you, who are these competitors? And like, are you networking? Whatever your personal brand is, and it doesn't have to be something that's, really out there on LinkedIn if that's not something that you want. But whatever it is, are you networking? And as we know now, you don't have to go anywhere to network. You can network from home. You can just make sure that your name and your face and what you can do are out there in your industry. So whether that's going to online conferences, um, I've joined a couple of just like networking meetups and they literally are just, let's just meet up and it's maybe like 50 people um, on on Zoom and they like put you in different rooms and you get to meet people I have met so many people that way so if you're not networking and you want to move externally you're shooting yourself in the foot that's such great advice because you're right you can you don't have to even leave your house you can just Mm -hmm. join groups and connect virtually and even if it's not on video you don't even want to do that you still can communicate to other people in the industry and that's so good such such a good good advice So switching back to company culture, how do we know when companies actually value culture? Mm, That's a good one, especially this is one that comes up when I'm coaching my clients on their interviews, like, you know, the quintessential, tell me about the culture here. And you're going to get lip service of their core values that nobody actually listens to. Um, But one of the things that one of the tricks that I have told my clients is to, you know, how companies want references. So they want three references. Two can play that game. I want three references too. So I want to talk to somebody that currently works there. I want to talk to somebody that's going to be on my team. So whatever, whoever that might be. And I want to talk to somebody that used to work there. And I did this for a company before and they actually, I got to talk to all three of those people and it was great because the person that doesn't work there anymore has no skin in the game anymore. They will tell you exactly what they think. And if I've had this come up with my clients where the company will be like, well, we don't want to do that. You can do it yourself. Go on LinkedIn, find somebody that used to work there and send them a message and say, I'm interviewing for this job and I just want to know about the company culture. You used to work there. Can I get 10 minutes of your time? I have never seen someone say no. Every single time that person's willing to get on the phone. (laughs) I love that you said that too, because you're the second person I've interviewed and it's been termed reverse references. Yes. And I think it's such a great idea because Mm -hmm. that really exposes what's underneath the hood Mm -hmm. about what's going on day to day. And you're right. It's not just to find something bad. It's just having an understanding from someone who's worked there and maybe you talk to two or three people. So you don't have just a one biased, Mm -hmm. that one biased opinion. Um, But I think that's such a great idea. And maybe it's something you can handle. So I will say I've had clients that have talked to someone and they told them like, hey, this is a company where like you're going to have to work long hours. The projects are hard. Da, 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 da. And this person was like, I, I, want, I still want it. I want to do that. I know what I'm getting into. So even if it just opens your eyes and makes it clear what you're getting into, it doesn't have to be all bad. But at least you know you're walking in with a clear mind. You know what you're getting into versus you think you're going to have work-life balance and then you get there and they're like, no, we need you to work 80 hours. You know, at least you knew what you were getting into. So, yeah, I think reaching out to people and actually having conversations and specifically the other one, having talking to somebody that's going to be on your team, because talking to, you know, the hiring manager and all of that, that's all good and well. But talking to someone that is going to be your peer and is on your team is a different perspective, because I always remind people 
people, there's a culture in leadership and then there's a culture with the team. And normally there are two very different cultures. And if you're interviewing with a hiring manager and the leadership team, you're getting one side of the culture. You're not getting the day-to-day -day project work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're completely right. And at baseline, you need to like each other. I mean, yes. you're not besties for the resties, but like at least generally have a good respect for each other's background and career and want to spend, you know, eight plus hours a day with them. Yeah, 100%. I think, and you, from a 30 minute conversation, you can glean that. Within five minutes, I can tell you if me and somebody's gonna get along. <laughs> so why does top talent value culture so much these days? You talked about your career coaching and you really having your clients dig into that. But I guess if you can elaborate more into the importance about why that is such a big thing right now. I really think it can make or break the employee experience. So you can love your task. So whatever your task is that you're doing, let's say you're, you're a project manager, you're working on amazing projects that really fulfill you. But if you are mentally drained by you know leadership or, or a particular someone, it doesn't even have to be a member of leadership, it can be a peer, it's going to have an impact on your work. No matter how you slice it, you can love what you're doing, but if you don't like the environment or you don't feel like you are valued or respected, it's going to show up in your work. So that is why most people that are looking for jobs right now, they are so keen on the culture and what is it actually going to be like because it's how it makes you feel when you go to work. You can love what you're doing, but let's be honest, most of us don't work in a silo. So you're still going to have to interact with people. Even if you work from home, I work from home. We are a fully remote company, um, but I don't work in a silo. I still have to work with a team. And so it really makes a difference on, I even think just like your psychological health, if you don't like what you're doing or who you have to do it with. Definitely, that's so huge. Um, and so how can talent acquisition and HR contribute to being part of enhancing the culture? We'll say maybe the, the culture is, good, could be better, I guess, mm -hmm. what, how does that role play out in your space? It's transparency. That's one of the things that I tell my team is when we do onboarding, um, actually when I started at Refine Labs, I wrote a culture book. And because I think the handbook is a legal document. It literally just tells you legally, don't do these things and you won't get fired. But the culture book actually tells you, this is what the culture here is like. And if you like it, please join us. If this is not for you, let us know. So from the moment someone starts with us, transparency. Like I want them to know what they're getting into. One of the worst things I feel like can happen is that they come in and they feel like it was a bait and switch. Like they were told one thing, they got here and it was completely different. So I actually think the statistic that people need to look at the most is like people that leave within the first 90 days. That tells me something happened in recruitment. They were told a lie. They were told that they were gonna be able to do something and they were never able to do it. So that statistic I think is a, the biggest red like red flag if people are leaving in the first 90 days now as far as like HR and recruitment what we can do from the moment you talk to someone tell them what it's actually going to be like and open the door for them to get the information from other people as well so make sure that your hiring process is transparent like for example right now there's the big debate about salary salary transparency it is on our job descriptions it is clear as day, here's the range, here's what you're gonna make. There's no bait and switch of like, oh, you didn't ask for that, so you just didn't get it. You know, that doesn't feel good when you start a job. I've seen that with clients. They start a job and realize they didn't ask for more, and now they're making about $15,000 less just because they didn't ask for it. That's not a good feeling. You think they're gonna stay? No, they're getting out of there as soon as they can. So I think the word for this is just transparency. I love that you brought up the pay, pay transparency topic because I'm huge about that as a recruiter. You know, I think that I, I'm completely transparent with the candidates too. I mean, I treat candidates how I want to be treated baseline. I've done that for 15 years. Um, I think it's the reason I've been so successful in this space because of that. And it's such an easy concept, but it's a lot of people don't do it because a lot of companies want to get a candidate at a discount or, yes. um, you know, save some money here and there, but then you're really it's just going to leave in a year, six months, mm -hmm. or whatnot. That's going to cost them more money in recruiting and to get on the hamster wheel again. Um, and They're so going to find out because people talk nowadays. They are going to find out. <laughs> yeah. So where's the balance then of with the pay transparency and not having, you know, every candidate come in maxing out that, mm -hmm. you know, 
high pay band? What would what, what you say? advice there yeah so one of the things that I'm a big fan of is giving people a range but telling them this is the average because what normally happens is people say like I you say oh the range is 90 to 125 they say well they want to know well like well what's the average like where are people so if you say most people in this role right now are making 115 at least they feel that's fair and the biggest thing that comes up is lack of fairness people feel like you're not giving them enough information and i know we've all seen the memes where it's like a shoot off of like like a shoot down of like tell me what you make no tell me the salary range you know what i mean like it's so funny but it's so real and it it just comes down to fairness like people want to be paid fairly so if you told me most people in this role here right now are making 115 then i would respect that but if i think that's the bottom and you told me the range was 125 then i want 125 you know mm -hmm. so making sure that you're saying the range and what is the current average of the people that actually work there because at least that gives people a starting point that's wise and everyone's going to come in with different ranges of experience oh, yeah. and different levels and i mean obviously if you have more experience or more you can ask the table you're going to be on the higher end but i mm -hmm. think you're right about managing expectations and so and i know the companies think that employees don't talk of course they all talk oh, about they do them. absolutely they do <laughs> I know, there's no stopping it and there's just like you might as well just be transparent about all of it and you know Hopefully the employee won't take that personally or whatnot, or if they do have a problem, come to HR about it or whatnot. Yeah. But hopefully through the recruiting process, they don't experience that. And so they'll stay. Yeah. And I think this new generation, like Gen Z are not playing any games. First of all, we all know they will talk about everything. They will tell their salary on TikTok all day long. So it's just funny because they have no quorums about telling you exactly what they make. And then they want to know how much you make. So it's very, um, I've seen this happen. I actually was at a lunch one time and this young lady, um, I didn't know, was very much interested in HR. And she's like, oh, so how much do you make in HR? And it was just really a flippant comment. I'd never even met her before. And I was like, this is very interesting. But you know what I mean? I never had like a complete stranger just ask me what my salary was. And she had no qualms about it. Like you could tell she didn't think twice about it. So that tells me right there that if she's willing to ask me, a stranger, she would definitely ask her coworkers. <laughs> so right about Gen Z and they're taking over. I mean, they're almost 25% of the job market right yes. now. Yes. I mean, and so companies are having to adjust to that. They're having to cater to that audience. They're having to recruit so on social media and mm -hmm. have apps and all the different ways they can get in touch with these individuals. And yeah, they're going to want to know about the pay transparency and what's oh, going yeah. they're making. Yeah. And they want to know, it's not just they want to know what their peers are making. They want to know what leadership is making. Like, I've definitely seen, I'm I'm not on TikTok, but I have a niece that's 22. And so she'll send me videos that she thinks are like HR related, which is really funny. And she'll say like, is this real or what's going on here? And so she sent me one where the lady was asking all, she was like just going around and asking random people, how much money do you make and what do you do for a living? And I found it fascinating. <laughs> Wow, I didn't know that about leadership, but that, I mean, I'm not surprised either because, I mean, they are demanding that and they're getting it and it's just going to continue as they continue to take over the percentages of the market mm -hmm. and everyone's going to have to adjust. So. Yeah, it's definitely happening. So that, that ship has sailed. <laughs> that is right. And so as we wrap up, Tell us more about your book, The Hidden Gem Within, and where can our listeners grab a copy and where can they find you on social? Yeah, so The Hidden Gem Within is on Amazon. Um, I'm so excited that it's just like out in the out in the sphere. It's out there for people. And so just to give you insight, it's a career focused journal. So it's part journal entries and prompts and then part me telling stories about like things that I've been through or how, what it is like to work in a corporate workspace. Based on my experience, I've been doing HR for about 13 years now and kind of me working my way up, like I said, from the beginning, not knowing any business terminology to now being an SVP of people and how that happened and all of that. So you can purchase a copy on Amazon. I would really appreciate it. I love all types of feedback and reviews. And then I am very active on LinkedIn. So you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I post basically every day. I'm super engaged on there. I think that's part of... Um, 
my, I think giving back is giving advice. And so one of the things that I really pride myself on, I'm really big, like I said in the beginning, on mentorship. And that's one way to do it is to have a personal brand and talk about things that you've been through or things that you see on LinkedIn. So that's something. So if anybody wants to chat, I'm always completely open. I do um, what I call little like 30 minute coffee chats, where if somebody just wants to have a 30 minute chat and talk about their life or their career or want some advice, um, I try to do like two or three a week. Um, just randomly, whoever wants to talk and, you know, I'm open. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you joining us. Thank you.